Hello and welcome to our program, Energy in Transition. I'm Joe Jenkins, Associate Media Relations Director at Central Hudson and today's moderator. The electric system that supplies our energy needs is undergoing a transition. As your local utility company, Central Hudson has taken proactive steps to help our customers and the region save energy, manage costs, and lower their carbon footprint. In 2019, New York enacted one of the nation's most ambitious climate laws, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or CLCPA, to drastically lower emissions and fundamentally change not only the electric grid and natural gas system, but also all of the ways in which we use our energy. The law brings about benefits and also potential challenges with system reliability, technical feasibility, and energy affordability. It's important that our customers are informed of the changes ahead. We've assembled a panel of leading New York specialists to talk about these issues and provide their views on how we can move forward. With us today is Ken Pakalski, Vice President of Business Council of New York, representing businesses and industries throughout the state. Gavin Donahue, a member of New York's Climate Action Council and President and CEO of the Independent Power Producers of New York, which is a trade association representing com companies in the competitive power supply industry in the state and Anthony Campagiorni, Senior Vice President of Customer Services and Gas Operations at Central Hudson. Let's get started. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. I think to level set, Gavin, we'll start with you as a member of the Climate Action Council. Could you give us a brief overview of what the CLCPA is and what the intended outcomes of the law are? Well, first of all, thank you for having me here, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to have this dialogue. The CLCPA is the climate law in New York, and the way you introduced it, I would say this is the most aggressive law in the country. Um, and for the, the folks watching this, this requires a 70% energy production from renewable energy resources by 2030 in New York State, zero emissions by 2040. So we'd have no emissions at all in 2040 and an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases. The thing that is important for everybody to realize, this is economy wide. This, this will hit every facet of our New York economy. So this is not just an electricity issue. Um, this is going to impact ag and markets, farmers, all sorts of manufacturers. So it's a very far-reaching economy-wide statute. Um, I was appointed to the council in 2019. We have been working as a member of this for t with 21 other folks on the council. Um, and we are scheduled to come out with a final scoping plan, which would be the roadmap on how to implement this law into the future uh, on December 19th. Um, there will be some controversy with it, for sure, and there's some, a lot of reasons why. Um, and then it will be given to the governor and the legislative leaders for their consideration in January of 2023. Great. So. Ken, I'd like to bring you in, if we could. Uh, how do businesses, industries, and other development organizations you know, perceive these upcoming changes? Sure. Again, I'd like to I'll say thanks for having us. Uh, you know, we represent uh, Central Hudson within our membership. We have about 2,300 companies statewide in all sectors, including if needs a member as well, the power generators. But the vast majority of our members are energy consumers, uh, manufacturers, service businesses, financial services, et cetera. I think it's fair to say most of those, uh, for most of those, energy policy is not their forte. Uh, and I do a lot of presentations to individual companies and to organizations, um, local chambers, sector specific groups. And I think there's still a large number of businesses who simply aren't aware. They may be aware, generally speaking, New York State's got these aggressive carbon commitments, but haven't really thought through how broad and significant the ramifications are. Think of this, by 2050, um, zero emissions, net zero emissions from the entire economy. So this is power plants, this is cars, this is trucks, trains, boats, airplanes, all the above, homes. Um, how we do that uh, is still you know, pretty unclear. But there's no doubt this is going to be a dramatic change in the way our members do business. Uh, it's going to be a dramatic way of change in the way their employees go about their life, both you know, coming back and forth to work and running their homes, uh, doing all the things involved there. So this is really big. And I, again, when I do presentations uh, to um, like the the Association of Cement Manufacturers or a Regional Chamber of Commerce, uh, their first reaction is, you know, oftentimes one of shock and surprise. And then the, uh, the second is of great concern. How do I, how could I possibly 
like change over, I you know, just built a new uh, you know, large commercial building, and now I'm being told I have to convert that from gas heat to something else. Uh, so it's, it's gonna be big, and I, I think uh, b uh, the business community, the vast majority of businesses, are still you know, learning you know, how big this is gonna be. Anthony, Gavin, I'd like to point this question at you guys. Uh, what are the roles of the utilities, regulators, and power plant owner operators in implementing this law? I'll start, and again, I, I wanna thank both Gavin and Ken to be here. I think for such a far-reaching law, what, what Ken had said is there's not a lot of understanding of what the impact is gonna be on both uh, consumers and businesses alike, and so I think this is an important conversation. We need to be having a lot more of these with such an extensive law. Um, utilities role, one is to do part of this, inform customers of what's coming, but look, our role will be looking to see what's promulgated out of uh, what the Climate Action Council is doing and how we enable this to become, uh, come to fruition. And so for us, there's going to be looks right now at our transmission systems. We're doing a lot on the bulk system uh, within the state, uh, both moving electrons from upstate to downstate, and also we're going to have to get offshore wind into the state and how we're going to move that. Um, but local distribution companies like Central Hudson We'll have to really build up their distribution networks. When we talked about two big sectors that this law is aiming to impact, it's going to be transportation and heating. And we're really going to have to have a build out of our distribution system and enable that. If you're going to electrify everything, we're going to move more intensive fuels like gasoline and oil to electrification. That's going to require quite a build out of our distribution systems. And so that's going to mean more substations and circuits that we're going to have to run. We're not ready for that today. We don't know exactly the impact, but the timing of that is going to be important because if you're looking to hit some of these goals in 2030 and 2040 and 2050, there's going to be a lot of costs and a lot of planning and studies we're going to have to do to make sure we can enable uh, these, these other sectors, heating and transportation to be electrified in the future. Right, I, um, I'll speak from the role of the power generators because um, the independent power producers, I represent over three quarters of the electric generation in New York State. We employ about 15,000 people across the state and we pay somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half to $1.7 billion in property taxes. I represent every fuel source in the state. So for us, um, for the business council, a lot of that, what's driving them, and, and I get it, is affordability, and that drives Anthony too. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't drive me, but what does drive us at the power sector and the generator sector is reliability. Like, how practical is this from a reliability standpoint? And I think from our standpoint, um, we have a lot of gaping holes in this plan so far about reliability. We have the state saying one thing, the ISO, New York State Reliability Council, calling on other technologies that need to be developed. So to get to Anthony's point, um, to accomplish these goals, we need to build out the electricity grid four to four and a half times larger than it is today. And what is that gonna take? That's gonna take more power. So where are we gonna get that power from is an important question. And, and I'm really proud of the record that we have as power generators. We, we in the last 20 years have reduced NOx by 90%, SOx by 90%, and CO2 in 20 years by 60%. So we feel like we've led the way, and where the carbon emissions are coming is something that Ken touched on, Anthony touched on, is coming from buildings and cars and trucks and transportation. So how we tackle really the building issue and the vehicle issue is a huge issue for New York State because of the amount of driving we have to do in New York State. And I'd just like to add to that point, and I think that's one of the misconceptions in the public. You talk about, and you see this in uh, news coverage and some, some of the advocacy all the time. This is Bill, this is power plants and big industry, but it's not. Industrial process emissions in New York State is like 2% of all emissions. Uh, power plants, is, New York State is, was the most uh, carbon efficient uh, energy producing state in the nation, even before CLCPA. Uh, it's vehicles and cars, I think vehicles and transportation <coughs> are you know, 75% plus yeah. of total emissions. So to, to get to, to achieve the emission reductions in this law, you know, industry is almost there already and power generation is heading in that direction. It's office buildings, it's homes, it's multi-family homes, it's commercial space, and it's cars, trucks, you know, the things that move us and our, the goods and services we rely on is where the major changes have to come. And people, I think most people, 
simply don't understand that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, John. Just one other thing that Gavin had said before, reliability. It's something that everyone takes for granted, right? You come home on a hot summer day, mm -hmm. you turn on the AC, you jump into the pool, you don't think twice about your power being there. But if you start looking at some of the reports, what Gavin's bringing up in, in the Climate Action Council, what you look at the New York ISO reports, the independent system operator, there's a big concern about what Gavin asked, where are we gonna get the power from? And when you look at the intermittency of these renewables and what you're gonna need, there's real concern about reliability. That's something we've all taken for granted for years around here, that we're not gonna have a rolling brownout, or when you want your power, you're gonna have it. I'm, I think people are raising a question whether that's gonna be so. If you're not careful, that could be breached, and that just can't be breached, I think, in this day and age here in this state. I do wanna to continue to talk a little bit about renewable energy and that 70% uh, renewable energy by 2030. Now, how, far, how much renewable energy, how much solar and wind do we have now, and how far do we have to go? Yeah, so I think we were blessed in New York State with hydro, which is kind of a legacy renewable. I think we're 28% of the way there. We have to get to 70 in essentially now seven years. Uh, but the magnitude and scope of what we have to do in the next seven years is, is daunting. Let's make no mistake about it. The amount of projects that need to be approved and built and financed in that next seven years is enormous. And I think we have a large, uphill battle to get there, I think, candidly. I think we, there's a lot that needs to be done on um, both siting and financing and building out projects here in the next seven years to come close to meeting that goal. That, that's my sense, and you know, obviously Ken and Gavin have a point of view as well, but we have a long way to go, Joe, to, to meet this goal in seven years. Sure. Um, I represent renewables. They play a vital role in New York on an energy diversity standpoint. They certainly help the grid maintain its reliability. Um, Anthony's point is well taken. We have an abundance of hydropower in New York State. We have a lot of nuclear power in upstate New York. Uh, what I would say is that emissions-free electricity is a big number in New York State. We have a lot of elect uh, emission-free electricity, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% of emission-free electricity. Can we get to 70 by 30? I think it's possible. Um, it's going to take a lot of things to happen right. And one of the things is really important is financing and affordability and whether folks can afford this. Um, the siting laws need to improve. A lot of things need to improve to, to get there. But can we get there? Conceivably, we could get there. My, my biggest complaint of the CLCPA is where do you get to the next 25 to 30 percent and by 2040? Because the law requires wind, solar, and storage. And we're silent about all these other innovative technologies, which I'm sure we'll talk about, that could come to New York. And that's where I feel like is the magic. Where's the rest of this magic going to come from? Because we don't know today. Now, Anthony, I think this is a question for you. Most of the renewable generation build out is going to be taking place in northern and western New York and off of Long Island shoreline. Uh, are existing transmission lines able to carry that energy to the downstate load centers? And if not, what do we have to do to get it there? Yeah, I think um, regulators are looking at that now. There are some segments being built from kind of upstate to downstate to move those electrons. You know, upstate's got a clean mix. Gavin noted that there's renewables upstate with wind, nuclear plants are up there. So upstate's relatively clean, more than 90% clean. Downstate, unfortunately, is the opposite side of the coin, right? About 90% fossil base. So moving electrons from upstate to downstate has already occurred. There's a couple of segments that have been approved. And look, we need to look at the, right now, off of Long Island, how you're going to move those electrons from offshore onshore. Um, there's public policy transportation, uh, transmission needs look being looked at right now. And there are going to have to be segments built to get this on land, onshore, and to move the electrons to where you need them in order to, to do that. So taking a look at the whole uh, statewide bulk electrical system is important, something that's, that's undergoing and happening right now. Um, but there needs to be a massive amount of build out to enable this future of all this offshore wind coming onshore and making sure we have enough power upstate that we can move to the load centers that are essentially downstate right now. And maybe one of the ironies of the CLCPA <clears throat> is at the same time it's demanding more of this uh, long term or long distance transmission. Other components of it are challenging the state as to where you can put facilities. There's a, and I know we're talking about this later as well, a huge focus in the, in the law about avoiding environmental impacts on so-called disadvantaged communities, mm -hmm. historically low-income uh, minority communities. Uh, they're seen as bearing the historic brunt of environmental impacts. So we're seeing this uh, on, on some of the, the, the offshore wind 
uh, transmission lines where they can come into Long Island. We know the what's called the New York Bight, which is a little bit further south. Um, most likely place for that power, the transmission line to come in is somewhere right in New York City. And they're already thinking about the challenges of finding uh, you know, pathways that aren't going to raise other CLCPA-based CLCPA objections related to environmental justice concerns. Anthony, I'd like to come back to you again. We talked about transmission, but with a lot of this environmentally beneficial electrification that'll be taking place, uh, that's going to put significant load demands on the local distribution centers as well. Uh, and for Central Hudson and the other other New York State utilities, what needs to be done in order to accommodate that? Yeah, a lot of planning and a lot of costs. I think Gavin mentioned, you know, depending on the utility, you could see 2x to 4x kind of build out of our current systems, and we're not sure exactly where that lands right now. But when you think about the amount of transportation, the amount of building and residential heating we're trying to move uh, to the grid right now, it, it's unprecedented, right, in terms of electrifying everything. So for us, there's two components. There's the planning aspect and how long that takes to plan and forecast of when it comes on and how it comes on. And I think, too, what we're really concerned about is this affordability issue that's been raised a couple of times today. You know, how much will it cost customers? I mean, the goals of the legislation are laudable. No one would argue with them. But the cost to achieve is something that I think we have to ask. We have to make sure we understand better. And what's too much for customers? At the end of the day, this all requires a lot of investment to make happen. We don't have the existing capacity we need right now today to electrify <coughs> transportation and the building and residential heating sectors. It just doesn't exist. And so that's going to take a number of years to build out. And it's going to take many, many billions of dollars to do. Well, can I just add one thing? One of the downfalls, I, I mentioned how the CLCPA limits technology and it just picks out storage, wind and solar. The other part of this law that is really a missed opportunity, there is no funding in this law. There was no identification about how to pay for any of this. So uh, one of the biggest gaps in the plan, in my judgment, is sort of what Anthony said, what are ratepayers going to be willing to bear to, to implement this, especially when you talk about upstate New York being essentially carbon free because we're really trying to address an issue that is probably from Westchester to New York City and Long Island. Um, and the issues around what Ken mentioned about disadvantaged communities in EJ, they're real, real issues that are going to get addressed somehow. How you address them and keep the lights on and keep it affordable are really important. Yeah. And Joe, and I'd just like to piggyback onto that too. You know, we're always concerned in the utility industry about how it gets financed and so many of these costs right now today are financed through the utility bill. But as Ken mentioned before, this has statewide impact on all industries and, and is that the proper vehicle in order to fund this transition, right? Is the utility bill the right place to do it? We certainly think it's not, but we have to have that discussion because it's going to impact everyone. Yeah, and one more, I guess two more factors we haven't touched on yet, but will come up. Uh, that's it's going to face this uh, energy transition is facing almost every business now is supply chain are you going to be able to get material on a timely timely basis and skilled labor because particularly you, you just since look at some aspects of this think of how many EV charging stations are going to be out there yeah. that up till now there is no industry to install and service those it's growing uh, but that's going to take a, a, a huge number of, of skilled people you know training uh, to do that work and uh, you know, we hear from our members all the time, the number one challenge we're hearing from businesses, New York, I think it's, it's, it's got to be nationwide, is finding, you know, skilled people to, to, to fill jobs that are available today. Yeah. I'd like to shift the topic a little bit to California and what we've seen there. I think it's pretty widely held that they're a few years further down the path in their efforts towards a clean energy transition than we are here in New York. And what we've seen there is uh, customers being asked to turn off large appliances or air conditioning during times of, of, of heavy demand. Uh, you know, as we look towards the 2030 and 2040 mandates of CLCPA, what can we look at California? What have they taught us that we can do in order to, you know, really maintain the reliability we have in New York's energy system? Well, I'll tell you, as, as somebody who um, is on this climate council that is, in fact, an energy expert, most of these folks are environmental advocates that are on this council. Um, I am trying to be the voice of, here's what not to do. Here's what California did, so let's avoid that. Um, I'm one of the few voices that are, that are taking that approach. But the reality is um, California has made a lot of missteps. Uh, they have now have RFPs on the street for natural gas, fossil fuel generation to make up the difference that they have um, from a supply standpoint. 
<clears throat> so I keep pointing out the California situation. Folks seem to be paying attention to it. Um, you know, you talk about California, don't forget Texas. You know, what happened in Texas still can happen again. I don't think Texas has made many changes that will prevent it from not happening again. Um, and the last thing we want from every standpoint is blackouts and brownouts in New York State. Um, so the lessons learned in California are something I keep harping on every meeting about, look what happened here. Um, we, can't, we need to avoid that. So, so that's a big issue. I'm relying on the ISO. And I think a lot of the great work the utilities have done to point some of these things out because they're very important, but they're not getting the consideration they need to by New York State. Yeah, and one of the things, you know, and, and Gavin said it before, is, you know, fuel diversity <coughs> is important. And, and this law was very prescriptive, right? It, it, it made, it picked winners and losers. And again, laudable goals, but you can't believe in 2019 when this law was passed, we know everything about technology in 2019 that we're ever going to know about technology. Let technology develop let markets develop and see what winners and losers look like. New York was blessed, I guess, with hydro, nuclear, and diverse resources on its generation. And that was great to also help mitigate cost impacts too, I think. And I think the more we kind of focus and pick winners and losers, I think that's to our detriment here in New York. I think we've got to be very careful about trying to pick technology winners and losers. We've got to let markets develop. We have to let technology develop. I think New York has to learn from that. And look, we need you know dispatchable base load generation. I mean, if you're going to have intermittent renewables, you need companions to them. When the wind's not blowing, the sun's not shining, storage isn't there yet and it might get there someday, right now we're going to need that really dispatchable base load generation. Quick start fuel right now, natural gas is, 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 it can do that, right? And so we have to make sure we're using the resources we have so we don't disadvantage customers in terms of both reliability and I think affordability, which are crucial uh, to this transition. And Ken, just to follow up on that a little bit, we've talked about the importance of reliability at a relatively high level, but you represent a lot of large business and industry in New York State. Could you discuss a little bit just how important resource adequacy and, and reliability is to, to the folks that you work with? For I think for all businesses, just like all homes, power interruptions or inconvenience. But for some, it's crucial. If you're in a, particularly in the, uh, the high tech field, <clears throat> some of these more advanced tech, uh, manufacturing technologies, an interruption in, the, in the, either the power supply or the quality of the power being delivered uh, can be extremely costly, uh, you know, sort of wipe out, a, a, wipe out a, a production run. And we've heard from member companies who've had those, had those issues even with our, our current uh, grid and some of the constraints they're seeing. Uh, I think looking forward, you know, you could envision you know, 20, 30 years from now, this, you know, how this, this, uh, this new green economy in New York State may look. <clears throat> but I think that transition uh, raises a lot of concerns look at, for companies who are looking to, who are here and looking to reinvest or expand, or companies look, be looking to come to New York State. Uh, and this isn't just electric power. Uh, part is, as we electrify buildings, uh, the, 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 uh, the flip side of that is the, there's a vision that we're going to significantly contract our natural gas systems. So if you're doing business today in an industry where all your production technology is based on national, natural gas, and we know some sectors, there's no commercially available electric-based production in the world. Uh, and I'm looking to reinvest in a facility in New York State that with a 20-year you know, uh, lifespan. That's a, a, a reason of concern. Is New York State going to deliver to me or be able to you know, promise to me that I'll get the both the quality, quantity, and affordability of energy right. that I need. And I will say this, I was, uh, you know, we have a diverse membership. I was meeting with one of my uh, developer members out in Western New York. First time I, I heard a, uh, a company, a, a developer say explicitly, I lost this potential manufacturing facility in New York State because of their long-term concerns about the effect of CLCPA on energy supply and cost. Yeah. So I do think we're going to, we're going to hear more of that as companies look at the practical aspects of what this is going to do to power supply, uh, energy costs, and, and the other side, natural gas supply. We're going to hear more companies raising those concerns. Yeah. And, and, and Joe, I, I would say, you know, Ken's concerns are right. And if you think about uh, a manufacturer, if, if we do this as a single state, there's no regional compact to do this, there's no federal law to do this, what kind of economic leakage might we have? So the cement plant that can't reinvest here, maybe goes to Pennsylvania, hasn't helped carbon emissions maybe 
globally, yeah. right? And so it's a it's a zero sum game, um, you know. But New York loses the the residents, the jobs, the tax base, and yet that manufacturer probably can still serve the local market by moving to an adjacent state. So if we don't do this regionally or even federally, I get really worried about New York's really aggressive push forward by itself and what it might do to businesses. Or even worse, it could end up in a in a jurisdiction that's less carbon clean than New York State already is. Right. And I do think the one of the few. I think major impacts we as a lobby organization had on the statute that was going through in 2019 is some consideration, some explicit recognition of this potential of emission leakage. If we're only forcing economic activity outside of New York State into another state or another nation um, that is you know, not as clean as New York State already is, there's certainly no, no global uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction benefit it's actually making things worse, and a net economic uh, uh, impact to New York State. So we think, you know, uh, this issue of of uh, emission and economic leakage uh, is very real, and it's gotten a little, I think, more than just a little attention in the, in the, the CAC debates. Um, they haven't. Been, there's a there's a work group that we served on dealing with energy intense trade exposed industries, and it seems like, uh, however the the, the, the Climate Action Council's final scoping plan comes out, it sounds like they're going to take a relatively light hand yes. to heavy energy intense industry. It goes back to Anthony's point, and you know, I inferred it, is picking winners and losers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that economic development project is more important than a different economic development mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. That is going to be a real problem for New York State, and it's going to be a problem for all of us around this table, but particularly business councils, how do you track businesses when you don't know how you're going to be treated regulatorily? It's a big issue. And it's something that this scoping plan has a significant amount of very important terms that are undefined. That's one of them. Trade exposure, energy intensive, fossil gas, hydrogen. None of this stuff is defined. So for me, I'm, it, it, that's very troubling. Anthony, Gavin, I'd like to have us talk a little bit about another topic that we've touched on today, and that's the idea of energy affordability. We've seen energy costs rising due to a forecasted colder winter. Uh, can you guys talk about some of the other factors that are contributing into rising energy costs, like geopolitical factors and other things that are related to our infrastructure? Sure. I mean, there's these are commodities that are traded worldwide, right? And so we see geopolitical events, you know, first the invasion of Ukraine by Russia had a, a, an impact across Western Europe. Uh, and we saw our markets being affected, a lot more liquefied natural gas being kind of transported um, to, to Western Europe had uh, uh, effects on our market here clearly. Look, New York State's inability to approve gas pipelines and some capacity constraints upstream have also been a problem. I think that has uh, aided in, in some of this kind of price, um, you know, the increases that we've had in surges. We've also had some things here, you know, uniquely with, you know, I think over the winter, uh, colder than normal winter was, was pretty tough for us here as well. So those factors all kind of contribute um, to the increase in prices. And we've seen customers really with their bills that have essentially doubled right now. And we're hearing a lot from customers right now saying, wow, it's a lot. And for, you know, our utility, what we're trying to do and what the state has an objective policy of is, you know, saying, we want to limit volatility. And so we have a lot of hedging in our portfolios these days on the purchase of power. We make no money on that. It's a pure pass through for us. Customers have the ability to choose their own suppliers. Um, but you know, the state does want us to try to limit volatility and we hedge a lot of our portfolios for normal weather. <clears throat> if it's colder than normal or warmer than normal, um, that has an impact because then you're buying that rest on the spot. But there's no question that uh, even the closure of Indian Point. Gavin pointed to nuclear. We, we subsidized some upstate nuclear with zero emission credits. In the same token, we closed downstate Indian Point. We've seen in our zone, that's really had an impact on, I think, on prices. The ISO kind of pointed that out in one of their reports. And uh, that's another factor that's, I think, contributed to, I'd say, higher energy prices right now. <clears throat> We were just talking about how New York's energy prices are based on, on, on a market system. Now, with the CLCPA's prescriptive approaches, Gavin, is this something that we're going to need to take a look at? Uh, or is this something that we might even need to fundamentally change due to this clean energy transition? Well, there's a lot in that question. Uh, <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> is, look, um, I think competitive markets have worked in New York. We've had a lot of private investment. We've retired a lot of inefficient, dirtier units. 
We have no coal in New York State. We have a better environment because of it, and we had lower wholesale rates. Um, that being said, the continuation of picking winners and losers is not getting the best price for the marketplace. So that's a problem. Um, I think one of the things that the, the listeners should know about is that in New York City, we're dual fueled. Everything is run on oil and gas. You can switch back and forth. Uh, if you're going to turn around by 2040 and tell me that New York City is not going to have any gas power plants, uh, I find that very hard to believe. And where, where we're getting at is we need to develop these new technologies, whether it's hydrogen, carbon capture, sequestration, renewable natural gas. We could be losing investments to other states because we don't have a market to say, hey, come invest in New York. Let's see what kind of zero emission technologies you have, how affordable it is, how available it is to keep the lights on. Because Anthony mentioned the word dispatchable. You cannot run this electricity system without dispatchable resources. So the markets are always changing. There's new products coming into the markets. There's demand response programs, all these things that, that change the markets. And, and we expect changes to occur. But the basic framework of how we price electricity and how we do it in New York, I think we're, we're pretty satisfied with. Um, it always can be improved. But the, the, the shortcoming here is we're not as a state putting out policies to attract new investment. And that's the problem. Yeah, and, and Joe, I, I would agree with everything Gavin's saying. I, I bet all three of us up here believe in markets. We want markets to succeed. <clears throat> we deregulated the, um, the generating system in 1999-2000. But there is a tension right now because we are picking winners and losers and we're not allowing technology <laughs> diversity to kind of move ahead. If you're picking winners and losers, you're not letting markets develop. And I think we're now at a point where there's a tension in the market principles versus picking winners and looter, losers with you know, you know, solar, wind, and battery storage right now. And so there's a tension, I think, that's happening right now. Gavin pointed to before, I think markets have worked well for many, many years. But I think right now we have to really question about what we're trying to do right now um, with the system and, and, and with technology. And I think you have to let technology develop right now. And this law really doesn't allow that. Gavin, earlier you gave us an update on where we're at in terms of the process with the scoping plan. Once that's completed, what happens next? What happens after that? Well, um, one, it will go to Governor Hochul and the legislative leaders for their consideration in January. Um, we as a, as a climate council have no authority to implement any of these policies. We recommend the policies to the legislature and the governor. Um, a policy may be as simple as an executive order from the governor, or it may be a regulatory change from a Department of Environmental Conservation, or a legislative proposal that needs to change the law. So there's a various ways that could, that could go forward. Um, DEC is going to, in 2023, begin to promulgate regulations about how to comply with this law. Um, a lot has stopped. We don't issue permits in New York, to get to Anthony's point. Um, we don't build natural gas pipelines. We're not building the necessary infrastructure. At some point, the state of New York has to come to grips with how do we keep the lights on, how do we keep it affordable, but how do we make it clean, and how do we make it comply with this law? And to me, they're just kicking the can down the road because they don't want to make those tough decisions. So in 2023, we may start to see some of those decisions being dealt with. But to date, they have not been dealt with. So um, the plan is what it is. It's a plan. And we'll see where it goes from there. But it has a lot of gaps in the plan. Yeah, it's not just permits for energy projects that are being held up. <clears throat> There's sort of a stopgap provision in the, in the <clears throat> law that says every governmental action, permit decision, you know, a grant and aid is supposed to be evaluated as to whether it's consistent with achieving the emission reduction goals of the CLCPA. I mean, that's a pretty wide open analysis. And what we're seeing, uh, not just for, you know, power production permits, but industrial permits, you know, m most of the major facility permits have a five-year life cycle. They come in for renewals all the time. They're always doing technical modifications to update the facility. And the agency is really challenged to turn that, you know, pretty broad, vague assessment of, is this consistent with the act? Uh, the law says if it's not consistent, is there a justification to be inconsistent? And if so, you know, what other mitigation? And they're really having a hard time giving answers. So we're seeing an increasing number of industrial facilities continue operating on their old permits. And in fact, uh, stymieing technical innovation at these facilities because DEC isn't quite yet sure how to write permit renewals 
uh, that are consistent with the act. Uh, and as Gavin said, uh, the, the, the scoping plan is not self-implemented. Uh, it, it, it tells the state government that decisions are supposed to be consistent with or informed by, I think the actual term, mm -hmm. informed by the scoping plan. Uh, but DEC needs to write, Department of Environmental Conservation needs to write updated rules for all kinds of emission sources. Uh, the legislature is going to act. They've already been moving legislation forward. Uh, we did a, a major update to the state's uh, building code last year. Uh, they've had proposals on the table already to require, by a certain dates, all new construction to be zero emissions. Uh, new York State, uh, uh, regulatorily, has already committed to all new light, I believe medium du duty vehicles sold by 2035 have yep. to be zero emissions. So yep. things are already moving forward, but there's a lot more, uh, you know, legislating or regulating that needs to be done uh, to give, you know, all of us, you know, the clear, you know, guidepost as to how we're supposed to go forward. I'd like to get back to something that was mentioned earlier in the discussion, but I'd like to expand on it a little bit if we could. And Gavin, I, I, I'll start with you. Uh, the CLCPA puts a sin pretty significant emphasis on environmental justice and economic equity. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the social justice aspects of this law? Well, uh, under the law, 40% of the revenue that is raised for any of these programs to implement, according to the statute, is to go to be directed towards disadvantaged environmental justice areas. Uh, there's a real problem there. I mean, in, in the 50s and the 60s, a lot of power plants, other industries, were located in New York City, in the outer boroughs, and then folks moved in. And these, were, these businesses, whether a power plant or a recycling facility, are still there. And these people are subjected to higher health impacts than the rest of us. Um, so me, I've become more and more sympathetic to this issue. And something has to be done, but we have to do it correctly. And, and I think if anything that is positive has come out of this Climate Council so far, it has forced people who come from different perspectives to get in a room and try to figure these problems out. And, um, but the, what the public should realize is that the law requires 40% of any funding to go to those communities. So that's going to be somewhat of a redistribution of wealth. Um, it's going to, uh, to have a huge impact on those local communities and hopefully in a favorable way, but at the same time maintaining reliability and affordability. Yeah, it's a big part of the law. I was going to say, it's, I think it's an underestimated part of the exactly. law. Exactly. Uh, there is a lot of uh, socioeconomic uh, <coughs> policy here that, you know, for example, the, these major offshore wind projects, one of the, one of the criteria by which uh, bids are being judged is the extent to which they're going to provide job opportunities or minority business opportunities in disadvantaged communities. Um, the law, it, we, we expect, and I think the scoping plan is going to have some guidance for the state to how much should be spent upgrading housing in disadvantaged communities. There's even suggestions that not just providing uh, renewable power to these um, uh, public housing, but also to, to uh, finance community-owned uh, power generation, particularly in the renewable space. So that's a major element, uh, making sure that you know, persons think of, if we're going to move to electric vehicles, one of the things we have less of is uh, garages. Are, are we going to, there's a major component of the act to make sure we're retraining, whether you're uh, in an energy sector, whether you're uh, working in the natural gas uh, supply system today in a job that's not going to be here in 20 years, to make sure that these, these economic disruptions in people's lives uh, are, are part of the, the, uh, the, the implementation plan as well. So that's a major component of the act. Yeah, and I think for us, you know, planning around where you build some of these facilities. Gavin mentioned that some of these facilities were built on the generating side, people moved in. I'll tell you, on the local distribution side, we're going to have to do a lot more of it. So you think it'd be even better, Con Edison, you know, putting all these cars, uh, electrifying all these cars are going to be like the equivalent of building some skyscrapers on some of these circuits. Where are they going to find the land to put another substation within those communities that you're serving? It's not a generating plant. It has maybe a visual impact, but it's got reliability impacts too. And sometimes those investments are made in your load pockets where you have densely populated communities. But that's a good thing because they have high reliability. And so we have to grapple with it. I think one thing that Gavin said earlier is that we're all getting into a room and thinking about being more sensitive to it and making sure we understand all sides of the argument so communities that feel impacted have their voice heard. And we're really working with those communities to make sure that these investments are situated properly within those communities if they have to be. 
Anthony, we've seen a lot of headlines in the news about public power and how it's being promoted by various polit political leaders as, as a way to potentially increase renewable energy build out and lower costs. Could you talk a little bit about what public power is and its ability to achieve these goals? Yeah, I'm, I'm no expert on it, but um, essentially municipalizing the systems, right? So having public ownership uh, through communities of uh, utility networks. I know there's been there's referendums, I think, in Maine and other places where people are looking to achieve that. I don't know that it helps at all uh, with the build out. Nothing that we can't do um, you know, locally here as utilities and working together with other people in the state. Um, so I don't know exactly why they think it could be achieved more readily through kind of a public power initiative. Uh, we get a little concerned when you look at investments govern governments have traditionally made. Um, you look at roads and bridges and things that increase taxes. I think they've had a hard time sometimes making the investments that need to be made. I think if you look across the energy sector every year, there's billions and billions of dollars of new investment that are being made to keep the grid very reliable, robust, and meeting the needs of people. Um, I don't think you really want to move away from that model. I think it has served us really well here in New York and, and actually throughout the United States mostly. Um, and so I'm a little bit concerned about some of these calls for public power and some of the panacea they think is going to be achieved uh, through that right now. That's my feelings. Yeah, I mean, New York State has a fair amount of public power today. Um, and I agree with Anthony. I think the, some, what some of the advocacy expectations of moving to public power simply aren't there. Uh, I know we were at, at, there was a public hearing on this topic, and uh, one of the state representatives pointed out whether I'm building it or one of Gavin's members are building it, they go through the same siting process, the same ISO interconnection process. That's not going to make that, the fact that it's a public finance facility isn't going to make it move faster. Uh, the other thing I think uh, there's some, you know, element here that they're equating public power with free power. And public power in New York State is not free power, but I think it, it gets to this socioeconomic impact concern of the CLCPA. And I, I do think there's a, there's, a, there's a concern that as people, you know, start feeling and understanding how this is going to impact the, you know, average household and even the lower income households, there's going to be a lot of pushback. So I think part of the there's this vision of public power is they're literally equating it with free power as a way to avoid economic impacts on, on some of the disadvantaged communities or other stakeholders here. And I don't think that's, that's not going to be the outcome either. No. So I think we're all in agreement that drastic action needs to be taken in order to reduce our carbon emissions. And we've talked a lot about what the CLCPA is recommending needs to be done in its prescriptive nature. But I'd like to talk a little bit about what we have done to get to where we're at. And Gavin, you spoke a lot about what the tremendous progress that the, uh, the power generation sector has made. So I'd like each one of you to discuss a little bit about what we've done and the progress we've made up to this point. Well, I, you know, I outlined at the beginning um, reductions in CO2 and NOx and SOx in particular matter. Proud of those accomplishments. One of the things we have in New York that other states, some have, some have, is a regional greenhouse gas initiative. But a price on carbon isn't something else we've talked about in this state. Um, it's controversial. You put a price on carbon, it's another tax for everybody to pay. How do you do it? Which economies do it? I mean, it's very complicated. But one of the things is that's happened in the last, let's say, 45 days, but certainly just happened last week, um, you have the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, Senator Schumer says New York State is going to get $70 billion for projects uh, by 2050 to do under that law. The Environmental Bond Act just passed $4.2 billion. A billion plus dollars of that are projects to go for climate initiatives. So right there, I mean, I've been fairly critical about the Climate Council and our scoping plan, uh, and I remain critical about that. But there are going to be opportunities in the state to invest in new technologies, in new uh, innovative types of things to keep the lights on that at the same time address the climate change issues that we're trying to address. So um, that's a lot of money for New York State and it shouldn't be just pushed aside. Folks should start to look at that as a way to invest in New York State. Yeah, I, I think um, it, one, of the, one of the other lost uh, points of this whole discussion is where New York State was in 2019 when this law passed. We were you know, coal was basically extinct in New York State, driven by markets, not by, well, a little bit by policy, but ultimately uh, by, by markets and uh, the, uh, 
the increased availability and reduced cost of natural gas. Uh, we also saw that happening in other states that were far more coal dependent on us, where the, the market development was pushing the, the power sector uh, to be more carbon efficient. Uh, and I do think New York State has, was well along. We, we've been matching the California car mandates, uh, I think literally since they're, they're, they were first adopted. So New York State policy was moving the state to be a more energy efficient and carbon efficient state. One thing I will say though, uh, one of the unfortunate uh, consequences of some of that action is one of the reasons why our industrial emissions are so low is New York State has lost a significant share of its industrial base. And that's a, com a, a wide number of factors. It's you know, energy costs is part of the mix. It's relatively high, high cost of doing business for a variety of factors. Um, and I think that's a, a lesson learned where we've heard you know, some skeptics of this concept of economic and, uh, and, uh, and uh, emission uh, leakage is you know, not happening. I so said we have 40 years of experience of economic leakage. Look at our, you know, we, we've lost half of our manufacturing base in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that's a significant impact, particularly once you move away to New York City. Uh, you know, think about some of the production that used to be in the, in the Hudson Valley, in the capital region, in central New York where, I, where I'm from. Uh, we've lost a lot, and I think that's got to be a, a lesson learned. We, we're already moving in this direction. I'm not sure we needed to you know, move as, as far and as fast as the CLCPA is driving us to. Uh, and there are you know, opportunities for investment, as Gavin said, but I think there's also that, that downside risk of, of if we're, we're driving you know, costs too high or limiting technology uh, t um, in ways that don't make sense. Yeah, I would agree with uh, things that they both said. I mean, look, we, we've been a leader in things like energy efficiency, which is kind of maybe one of the lower cost solutions. We deregulated markets, which I think had had some opportunities for us in the state and, and helped in some of the environmental factors that, that Ken spoke about. But we have to be careful. This is a balancing act here, and we, we all believe in the law. We want to get to the goals. But how do you get to the goals matter here, and it matters a lot for New York State. You know, e each one of us have probably had some time in state government, whether it's D.C., the legislature, Empire State Development. I mean, we love New York. We've been fighting on behalf of New Yorkers probably most of our working lives. We deeply care about this state, and we're at a critical juncture now that no one's against these goals, but how you implement them, being careful about the reliability of the system, the affordability system, you know, this loss that we've been having for 40 years in New York State concerns us all. And so these are just discussions that we want to make sure we're having, and I'm not sure there's been enough of them wide enough and there's not enough of understanding. So I think today is an important point to make sure that we're having robust discussions and debate about how we get there because it really matters for the future of the state. And I think that's what we're here to discuss today and, and what's really important for people to understand that this matters going forward. Now, before we wrap up, I would just like to give each one of you the opportunity to add anything else to the conversation that you'd like. And Gavin, we'll start with you. I think it's important that folks re require the state of New York to be consistent in its regulatory message, or we're going to lose more manufacturing, we're going to lose more jobs, we're going to lose more taxes. Um, it's really easy to pick on the power sector. It's everybody loves to beat up, whether it's a utility or a power generator. But at the beginning, I, may, I raised an issue that gets pushed off a lot. The sector I represent pays a billion and a half to $1.7 billion in property taxes. They employ a lot of people. You want to close all these power plants, you better have another way to make up the tax revenue in upstate New York where there are not a lot of jobs. So that's a big thing we didn't talk about today. But to me, um, I want to move quickly with this transition, but I want to do it smartly. And I want to recognize that when you press on that balloon on one side, the balloon is going to pop on the other side. And that's an important factor for folks to realize. So I'm looking for regulatory consistency, practicality, and more reliability. Yeah, you know, when I look at our my membership, particularly our larger members who are multi-state or multinational, almost every one of them has environmental uh, environmental policies in place, uh, commitments to reducing energy usage and and their carbon footprints. So they, they they get it. I think it's there's no doubt that we understand the need uh, for for not just New York State but the the planet to become more carbon efficient and more mindful of all all types of environmental. Uh, all types of environmental uh, impacts. And as Gavin said, the real issue for us here is the path forward. And you know, the risk of doing things that are 
you know, actually have a net carbon impact and no, you know, no economic value to the state is, is the risk. We think there's opportunities uh, as we see the state uh, making investment, major investments in offshore wind and, and power uh, transmission, et cetera. You know, one of our goals is to see how New York State can capture as much of that you know, supply chain uh, in New York State in ways that we had maybe hadn't before, make that an explicit you know, policy objective of the state. Uh, but the real key is y you've got to do this smart. Um, just uh, you know, mandating the, the elimination of, of power generation and fuel uh, diversity isn't going to get us there, and it's going to have you know, adverse impacts. It's going to impact everyone, not just business, but uh, residents of New York State as well. Anthony? Yeah, uh, couldn't agree more. They've signed on to a set of principles here. I think both uh, Gavin, Ipney, and, and the Business Council of New York State, we would agree with most of them as well. Um, but, you know, when we look at this, I think it is this balancing act, right? We talked about reliability can't be breached. This transition has to enhance the livelihood of New Yorkers, not, not harm them, right? We have to pursue these carbon emission strategies at the lowest possible cost. I think we'd all agree with that. And I really believe we have to have all options on the table for technology. You cannot pick winners and losers in 2019 in a law and pretend that that's going to carry your way to 2050. So I think those are things that we have to be cognizant of. We're all supportive of the goals, but how we get there is really what we want to make sure we have vigorous debate about right now and getting there in the best way for all New Yorkers. Great. Thank you all. This concludes our discussion on the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. We hope you found it informative. I'd like to thank Anthony, Gavin, and Ken for their time and insight. Central Hudson will continue to host events on important issues impacting the residents of the Mid-Hudson Valley. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn for more information. Thank you for watching.